it wasn't anything mysterious. He would simply lie down on a couch. He would, if he had a tie, a collar on, he'd loosen his collar, loosen his shoelaces, and just cross his hands over his stomach and just relax. There was a window, maybe 30 seconds, maybe 60 seconds, when his eyes began to flutter. And it was at that moment that you could put a question to Edgar Casey. All he had to know was the name of the person the reading was for and where he was at the time of the reading. Could be in California or Kalamazoo, it didn't matter. Strangely, whether he gave a diagnosis or predicted the future, Casey forgot all about it as soon as he opened his eyes. He didn't remember anything. He didn't remember anything that uh, he said at the reading. And soon some unscrupulous clients caught on. People would slip in a question about who's going to win a horse race or what's going to happen in the stock market. And he would answer them much to their profit. As clients got rich, Casey started to suffer from inexplicable migraine headaches. Where there were selfish purposes involved, it was as if the radar screen got fuzzy. He couldn't tune in as clearly or as accurately. It made him ill or made him upset stomach. He just said, I'm through. I'm not doing this anymore. In 1912, with Gertrude and his little son Hugh Lynn in tow, a disillusioned Casey left Hopkinsville and the predictions behind him and moved to Selma in Alabama, where he resumed work as a photographer. He continued that work until my brother dropped a match in a partially filled can of flashlight powder and burned his face terribly. And all the doctors said, well, he'll never see again, and my brother asked my father for a reading. Two weeks later, after following his father's instructions to the letter, Hugh Lynn's eye was as good as new. Dad realized that he could help people again and that he thought that maybe that's what he ought to do. But he made it a rule that Mother would be the one who asked the questions so nothing could happen like happened with Hopkinsville. Edgar Casey was poised to discover new amazing abilities. His spine-chilling visions were about to turn him into the most famous prophet of the 20th century. In the 1920s, Europe was still reeling from the disastrous consequences of the First World War. But across the Atlantic, America was enjoying its ascendancy to global superpower status. It was a time of frivolity and fun and rapid social change. Big corporations were forming, technology was on the rise, and we were changing from an earlier, simpler people to a much more complicated society. Edgar Cayce represents, as do great actors or poets, an individual who speaks out of the collective need of his time and place and culture. Clients consulted Cayce about everything under the sun. Oil prospectors asked him where to locate their oil wells. Some of the most remarkable readings before 1923 are oil readings, geophysical readings. Edgar Cayce gives almost a foot-by-foot -foot breakdown of the geophysical conditions for a particular site. And invariably, he was right. He was dead on. Great minds also visited the sleeping prophet. Thomas Edison received readings uh, on the nature of electricity. Woodrow Wilson, president of the United States, who was suffering from a heart condition. We know that George Gershwin received readings. We know that Nelson Rockefeller received readings. Edgar Cayce was extraordinarily eclectic in his psychic work, but his predictions on world affairs, complete with dates and vivid descriptions of events, are a testament to its accuracy. Some of the world affairs readings are absolutely scary. It was like he was reading the headlines four years in advance, consistently. He's under trance in 1925, asked by a client how the future of business will be, and he says, better pull your stocks out. In the adverse forces that will come then in 1929, care should be taken, lest this be taken from the entity. Casey foresaw the onset of the Great Depression four years before it occurred, and then, in 1931, he accurately predicted the end of the hard times. In the spring of 33 will be the real definite improvements. 
the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And of course, that's the New Deal, when we did slowly start to get out of the uh, Depression. Casey also made several predictions about the oncoming World War. In 1935, Edgar Casey was giving a reading to a 29-year-old freight agent, and the individual wanted to know about affairs of an international nature. Casey predicted that there would be an alliance between the Austrians, the Germans, and the Japanese. He says in the reading, and unless there is interference from the divine, the whole world will be set on fire. In 1935, no one had any idea that any of this was about to happen. The League of Nations was still in being. Another war seemed implausible. And yet... Edgar Casey seems to have had a psychic sensitivity to the coming of World War II. There were certainly things in the news that were the clouds of this coming war, but he targeted the time in which it might begin to occur, and even its end, and many of the dynamics that went on during those war years. Casey also foresaw social upheavals that would develop long after his death in 1945. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Edgar Casey's accuracy with predictions is also uh, suggested by his statements about how mob rule could potentially happen in the United States, particularly if there were some social changes. Ye ought to have a division in thy own land, before ye have the second of the presidents that next will not live through his office. A mob rule. In April 1945, Roosevelt died in office. Kennedy was assassinated in November 1963, at a time when the civil rights movement was exploding. That one instance points to how important it is to see that Edgar Casey was also a commentator on social affairs. He said that unless there would be a kind of leveling that would come in society, that there couldn't be one rule for those who were rich and privileged and a different rule for those that were the have-nots, that we were in for tremendous difficult changes in our culture. With this thing, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together. Casey was not a Republican or a Democrat. He wasn't trying to advocate any particular political agenda. But he clearly had a moral sense about something that needed to be achieved if we were to fulfill our destiny as a nation. Casey's visions would be lost to us today if it wasn't for Gladys Davis. She was a young stenographer Casey engaged in 1923 to record every word he uttered while in a trance. She was much more than a stenographer. She really completed the work. And it's because of Gladys Davis that we have the readings today. I felt an instant attraction to this man. I just trusted him. One day during a reading, he said a string of words, so I was wondering whether he, whether I should put um, a dash or a comma or uh, just how to uh, word this. And uh, over there asleep on the couch, I mean, his eyes closed, he said, put a comma between these. <laughs> After she took the reading, she then typed it up into a copy that she would send to the person who had the reading. In the interest of confidentiality, all the names of the people having readings were removed and numbers were inserted.